<laughs> we do thank you for joining us here in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium for this special presentation. Some of you may have been here in February 2011 when the same team was on stage. They were so popular, we invited them back for a second show. Uh, we would appreciate everyone checking that your cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And of course, internet viewers who are watching us can send questions for submission simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org and we will post the program within 24 hours for everyone's future reference. I'm happy now to turn the program over to Heritage founder, Dr. Edwin Fulner. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's really great to be back and to have this opportunity to chat with a dear friend of ours, uh, someone with whom I go back a long time and Heritage goes back a long time middle 1980s, you were chairman of Heritage Associates, which meant uh, you were giving us $10,000 a year. So you must have thought we were doing something right. And uh, he was a bright young man back then. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at the suggestion and the urging of our then chairman of the board, Frank Shakespeare, I called and said, Don, we'd love to have you serve on our board of trustees. You said, let me think about it. I'll call you back. And that's one thing Don Rumsfeld's very good about. That's one of his rules is return your phone calls. And he's <laughs> very, very good. Call back the next day and you turn me down. I had said, too we many, didn't need you. No, I had too many peas on my knife and I was afraid I'd drop some off if I took on any more things. No, but you talk about the role of a director. Yeah. And I think that's kind of an interesting management subject when so many boards of directors are in the news of companies, and you have been a very successful businessman, a CEO, and what do you expect from a board of directors? Well, you expect outside advice. You expect something that's, that's from a different perspective. The people inside tend to talk to each other, go to lunch with each other, think over time like each other, and a board of directors, if it's well designed, you bring in people who are not part of that group and who will have a perspective and preferably experiences different from the people inside. And, uh, and you hope that they'll offer suggestions and calibrations and, and, uh, and advice that you don't normally get up through the system. Mm. You know, uh, Admiral Rickover has w one of the rules in my book was by Admiral Hyman Rickover. And, and he said, never give a command outside of, of the chain of command and never expect to learn anything up the chain of command. <laughs> So, you, well, clearly you don't agree with that because how could you do snowflakes? That's, of course, you, you were the chain of, you're the top of the chain of command, so I guess you can do a snowflake down to anybody. That's right. Uh, it was like a blizzard. Yeah. But doesn't that kind of contradict the notion of doing it through the chain of command? It depends on, you never give an order outside of the chain of command. But you can make an inquiry? Oh my goodness, and ask a question. Sure, that's fine. I'll bet you, they say I wrote 20,000, embarrassing to even, but confession's good for the soul. 20,000 <laughs> while I was Secretary of Defense the last time. Snowflakes, memos. Now some were very short, and it said, I'd like to see somebody. And, but, but others would, you know, I might do five, four or five drafts of a memo on an important subject. And um, almost always at the end, I would say, how does this sound to you? Or does this make sense? Or what are we missing? And uh, it, it, it would be a way of putting structure into some thinking, but then saying, look, what's missing? What, what, haven't, what haven't we thought of? Give me your edits or suggestions. And, and that's, I, 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 I think there's so few where I really gave an order or a command, unless the, it was a presidential guidance that mm -hmm. needed to be communicated. Almost always it would be asking questions or trying to find out something or exploring something or looking for ideas. If one of your rules is you should never have more than 10 rules, why do you have 380 some rules in your, I mean, it makes for a better book. I just, guess. Lucky. Yeah, just lucky. Just yeah. lucky. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I did. I put that at the end just, yeah. Yeah. For, just for good humor. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. The rules, I, I, I should be said that, that it's, it's titled Rumsfeld's Rules because that's what President Gerald Ford titled them. 
the truth is they're not all Rumsfeld's. In fact, most are not mine. They, they may be Mrs. Thatcher's. When, when she said uh, the trouble with socialism is pretty soon you run out of other people's money, um, or, or from any number of people. Churchill said something that's relevant to the uh, situation in Korea. He said, dictators ride the tiger to and fro, and they're afraid to get off. And, and there, it, the book is filled with those kinds of things that, that others have said. And a lot of them really aren't rules. Uh, they're thoughts, ideas, or guidance that that's, I wrote down. It all started because my mother was a school teacher. Hmm. And I asked her what the me word meant. And she said, well, write it down and look it up. And so I did. And I started collecting words, and not to the extent that our friend Bill Buckley did, but... but um, the, then I started keeping thoughts, and it's amazing, you know, habits are tough to break. I still carry uh, these things and write down things, and at the end of the day, I dictate them. And, and uh, I made some comment to President Ford when he came in as the first and only, the good Lord willing, uh, person who served as president, who'd never run for president or vice president, and uh, we hope we never go through that again. Uh, but, but he heard me say something, and... Uh, he said, well, where'd you get that? And I told him. And so he said, well, let me see these things. Well, they were in a shoebox. They weren't they were filed. They weren't even typed up. So I had them typed up and gave them to him. And he, he labeled them Rumsfeld's Rules and, and uh, asked me to send them around to the senior staff. And they, they kind of took on a life of their own after that. Yeah. yeah they, earlier versions, I must emphasize, earlier versions, you got to get the real book are on the internet and they're still available yeah. under Rumsfeld's rules so you can get them for nothing but we want people to no. get the book. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you guys find this fella? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh, you, Jerry Ford and you and I have a number of political friends in common. You, you make the point in here that he found it hard to fire people. Is that true for every politician because because it makes them unpopular, or well, it's they're no worried fun. about it, or it's no fun. It's well. hard. First of all, I I say in there one of my thoughts is personnel mistakes are generally the person doing the hiring, not the person who's being hired. And so, if you're going to have to fire someone, it's often because you made a mistake, and you know down in your heart that uh, personnel mistakes don't get better with time; they get worse. Uh, and they're, in truth, it's better for the person as well as the institution, because if it's not a good fit, it's, it's better for everybody to, to find some place that it is a good fit. But I, um, in the case of Jerry Ford, it, it was neither of those. His, his problem, when he became president, the Vietnam War was coming to a difficult end, the economy was in the tank, uh, the reservoir of trust had been drained in the country, the White House was deemed to be illegitimate. There was a special prosecutor running around asking everyone, what did you know and when did you know it? And he came in and, and he was persuaded basically by Al Haig and, and I'm sure Henry Kissinger that, that it was terribly important that there be continuity, that, that the world, who didn't know Jerry Ford, he'd never run, and uh, uh, th that the world see that the Nixon foreign policy, which was well respected around the world, uh, would, would be continuing. And that's the half of it. The other half was domestically, the cabinet, the White House staff. Mm -hmm. Jerry Ford it was just a wonderful human being, decent. You know him and uh, knew him. And, and he concluded that anyone he let go, would someone might suspect, had some complicity with respect to uh, Watergate. And so he was in... In decided to keep the White House staff and keep the cabinet and continue favored continuity over change. My view was just exactly the opposite. My view was that he'd be a lot better off, the country would be better off, and even the people in the cabinet and the White House would be better off if he just came in with a big smile and said, fair enough, we have a new president, I didn't ask for it, I didn't run for it, but I'm here and by golly we're going to bring in my team and we'll go about the country's business. And if he'd done that and let some people go, instead of being seen as a Nixon-Ford presidency, it would have been seen as a Ford presidency, in my view. Mm -hmm. I think I was right and he was wrong. And uh, 
not surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he decided I was right, eventually, and said, you're quite right. And he ended up making some changes. But he, he also had a, a theory that he, he had to be the, the non-Nixon. And so he, the, there were two people working in that White House, uh, Bob Haldeman and, and John Ehrlichman, with German names. And, and, and they called it the Ber Berlin Wall. And uh, it happened that Bob Haldeman was just an enormously effective chief of staff. He mm -hmm. pretty much designed the system after Eisenhower had Sherman Adams there. And, and that was kind of the first chief of staff was, was under Eisenhower. And then under Nixon, uh, Bob Haldeman designed a system that really helped make it work. But because it was connected with, quote, the Berlin Wall, Jerry Ford decided he didn't want that. And he uh, would have a spokes of the wheel where everything would come into him. Um, and I explained to him one day, I said, you know, Mr. President, you know what happens in the hub where all the wheel spokes come in? The grease gets overheated and has to be replaced. And I don't think that's going to work. In fact, I know it's not going to work. And if you do it, I don't want to be a part of it. And I went back to NATO where I was ambassador to NATO. And gosh, within a matter of a month or two, he called and said, it's not working. <laughs> and and uh, come on back and be chief of staff. And uh, I ended up doing that. So don't yeah, yeah. let anyone tell you that the spokes of the wheel is the way that the uh, White House ought to operate it. Well, I don't like sitting with no. my back to all these folks over there. You know that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a bad deal. Okay. As a broken down ex-politician, I like to know what's going on <laughs> behind me. I'm not going to sit there like a dummy and let who knows what could happen. You, talking about the White House, you made the point uh, to uh, appearances by the president should be limited to give credence to the importance of his words. That might have been true back then, but you know, with starting, I guess, with Bill Clinton and the instant response through George W. Mm -hmm. And certainly today, I mean, uh, you know, the current president is hardly ever around. Is is that better, worse, different? Well, you know, in our country, leadership is by persuasion. And, and um, to be persuasive, you have to be believable. And I think that it is true that overexposure by a president can, can be damaging. And certainly, having things said that turn out not to be quite the case erodes trust. And to the extent trust is eroded, uh, there's no question but that your ability to lead is, is damaged. And uh, th this latest perfect storm that's going on in the White House, it seems to me, is, is an example of that. Uh, you, you, something gets said, and it, it can be said with, with all conviction that it's true. And then it turns out not to be true a week or <laughs> 10 days later. And, and what happens is the reservoir of trust gets drained and your ability to lead. And, and I think that. The, the currency a political leader in our country has is not that he can command and tell people what to do. It's, it's that he or she has to be believable. And the, it, the, one of the rules in there is trust leaves on horseback and re returns on foot. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is easier to lose credibility uh, than it is to restore it. And, and so you, you have to husband that. that. That's important, it seems to me. Going back to your wrestling career, the first thing you said you learned from when you took up wrestling was you had to think about the wrestling match from the other guy's perspective. I do. Now, I have a chapter on wrestling. Yeah, in yeah, there. yeah, and what, what you learn. So, what does that mean? I mean, is that whether you're you're talking to uh, the uh, in the mirror in the Middle East, or whether you're, you know, what, what's the other guy's perspective if we're talking to Pyongyang? Well, uh, the, fir the first rule for wrestling for me was uh, the, the relationship between effort and results. And, and, you know, the harder that you work, the luckier you are. And, and, and at the end of a wrestling practice, you'd want to go take a shower and get out of there. And, and uh, instead, you'd go out and run two hours, I mean two miles. And, and uh, 
and, and try to get better shape and better shape and better shape. The rule you're referring to is an important, and that is, this is an important rule not for wrestling only, but for everything in life. It's helpful to try to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. And it doesn't matter if you're talking to one of your youngsters and, and they're trying to talk you into something and you have to kind of put yourself in their shoes and see what the world looks like from their standpoint. Uh, it's also true in wrestling. I mean, there's no question. If you're watching the other person, and try, you have to try to figure out what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and, and what they might be doing next and how you can get them to move in a way that advantages you. It's cl clearly true in diplomacy. Uh, where you're, you're negotiating with somebody. Uh, I mean, another rule in there with negotiations is you don't have to fill every silence. <laughs> I mean, let the other guy fill the silence. Uh, and if, you're, if, you're, if you feel it's awkward or embarrassing that there be a long period of silence, don't worry about it. If it is awkward and embarrassing, it's awkward and embarrassing for the other person. And then they'll start jab, I mean talking. <laughs> and, and saying something that maybe they wouldn't have said if there hadn't been that period of silence. So, and, and, um, but in negotiating, you do have to put yourself in the other person's shoes and, and, and try to figure out what in the world their hopes are. What are their expectations? What, what do they need? What are their limits? Uh, what are they trying to achieve? And, and where in there might you find areas of common interest? The last thing you want to do is have a, a successful negotiation if it means you've got to compromise that which you feel is critically important. The, the purpose of negotiating isn't, isn't to get an agreement. It's to get an agreement that's acceptable to you. And some people get into a negotiation and feel that the purpose of negotiating is to get an agreement at any cost, at any price, and they end up agreeing to things. You talk about that in here. You should talk about clientitis mm -hmm. and one of our very close joint efforts over the years has been uh, pointing out some of the difficulties and challenges that a law of the seas treaty might have for the United States. And we, you and Heritage talked about that back in the early 80s when you were representing the President of the United States running around the world and saying, hey, for this, isn't such, a, this mm -hmm. isn't such a good idea. And yeah. here we are still fighting the same thing 30 years later. Is it that there's somebody over in the State Department who's built his whole career on this, and uh, when he gets his uh, retirement uh, watch, wants to say, hey, I was successful? What is it? There I don't know. I mean, I mean when, they, when they went to President Ronald Reagan and said, Mr. President, it's time to sign the Law of the Sea Treaty, and uh, we're going to have, I don't know, 120 countries gathered down in Jamaica, and and uh, who would you like to send? Do you want to go and sign it, or should I go and sign it, or somebody else? And he said, well, I don't think I want to sign it. <laughs> and it was a showstopper. Uh, and instead, he, he had George Schultz, his Secretary of State later, call me up and say, they wanted me to charge around the world and talk to world leaders and uh, persuade them that, that it wasn't a good agreement, that there were problems with it that needed to be fixed. And, and I did do that and uh, the, the most memorable meeting was you know you go into these meetings and uh, diplomatic meetings and often there's 15 people in the room and they've all got notepads and they're making notes and and, and I went to see Mrs. Thatcher uh, and Downing Street she was the Prime Minister and she was alone unusual um, and I, I walked in and, and told her what the president asked me to tell her and described the law of the sea and how it would work and and that there was this thing called the in a kind of an Orwellian way the authority <laughs> that, w that was going to manage uh, the um, resources in the seabeds of the world and uh, the more I talked and finally she said well Mr. Ambassador the way you've described it it sounds to me is as though what we're talking about here is the international nationalization of two-thirds of the Earth's surface. And she said, you know what I think of nationalization. <laughs> <laughs> She'd been fighting with all these government people, and, and uh, she, she summarized it just about as well as anyone could. I, I went across the channel and met with Mitterrand in France, a, a socialist, and the more I talked with the same arguments, the more he liked it. <laughs> <laughs>
she was a, a great ally not only on that issue but on so many others as well but at that time I remember you telling a group of us at Heritage it's not in the book but a little insight that were you at Cyril then I was uh, running a pharmaceutical company GD Cyril yeah. and company yeah I think you told me I'll go public with it it cost you something like sixty thousand dollars to file all the forms to get this part-time job for which you were paid I don't know nothing nothing uh, how do how do we get the best people from the business world you point out here that we're down to 22 percent of cabinet level people who have actually had business experience under Reagan it was probably 70 75 percent how do you get good people to make that kind of sacrifice I guess if you're Penny Pritzker uh, you can afford it uh, but it's, that was it's the understatement tough, of the day <laughs> <laughs> but but seriously isn't this a, a, a real problem in terms of how you get people confirmed how you get them through the process and you must have seen that especially when you came back to defense the second time yeah well I had the great advantage when I served in government originally is I didn't have a nickel it makes it easy to fill out the and forms so it was a short form yeah. uh, and uh, then I was in business for 20 years and would have to come in and out doing things for President Reagan or somebody else and, and then back full time for a while. It is, it is very difficult to get good people in and it, it takes time. First of all, a lot of them simply don't want to go through what you have to go through. And um, I ended up functioning at the Pentagon for six years this last time where we had, I, I'm going to be close enough for government work, but give me a 5 or 10 percent margin on this. Uh, there were, I think, 47, maybe Steve Bucci remembers, 47, I think, presidential appointments Senate confirmed in the Pentagon in an outfit that has millions of people. So th that amount of leverage, it, 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 and you know, I can go to a piano and pick up a piano with two hands, the end of it, lift it a little bit off the floor. But, but we functioned for six years with 26% vacancy in the 57 presidential appointee Senate confirmed jobs. I mean, that's like trying to pick up a p piano with two fingers. It's hard. And, and your leverage is gone. And of course, it favors and advantages the permanent bi bureaucracy. And, uh, but it's very hard. It takes time to get all the financial things you have to could go through. You have to go through FBI clearances. Uh, you have to go through a Senate clearance. Uh, and um, you have to go through the, the White House clearance, political clearance. So you have all these multiple clearances. And, and the amount of time it takes, uh, I mean, I was in the Pentagon, I think, for six months. And uh, during that period, maybe we had one or two people had, who got through confirmation besides me. And I basically had to beg the people from the prior administration uh, to stay on and give me a hand uh, just to help out. And, and there was a terrific deputy, uh, Rudy de Leon, who did stay on, and God bless him for it, because you need the help. But that isn't, that isn't the way it's designed uh, to be working. And, and it is very, very hard uh, to, to get through that clearance process. One of the one of the laws you've expounded in the past that didn't quite make the 388 is the Rumsfeld law that make a decision as early as you can because every day somebody either above you or below you is limiting your range of options. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. President, you know, a lot of the easy things get solved down below. And when it gets up to the president or the very senior levels, I think it was Dean Acheson that said that, that, that the, those decisions are the tough ones. And if they don't get solved, if they don't get addressed in a reasonable way, what, what happens is the president loses his options. They get eroded, and they get eroded for a couple of reasons. One is you normally try to debate those things internally within the administration uh, in, in getting them into the White House. So the president knows that these are the different options, and these are the pros and cons, and here are the people that are for it, and one of these options, here are the people against it, and so forth with the other options. Uh, the, the, the problem is, if, if decisions are delayed, they start getting debated out in the press. And the person who 
some guy three or four layers down uh, begins leaking out in the press that these people are for this and somebody else is for that and pretty soon you've got the debate going on not inside but outside and you've got no problem debating something after you've decided it outside but <laughs> if it's debated outside while you still haven't addressed it then the president's options get narrowed down and and that's unfortunate because uh, presidents need some flexibility and the ability to to make the judgment because only if they make it in a timely manner um, the, the person who the American people elected then are making it to the extent that it gets made down the line before the president gets there obviously uh, it's the press that's making it and and the and the people who leak things out that are making it and that's harmful your last two responses really uh, undergird that great rule you put in here People are policy. Without the best people in plus, place, the best ideas don't matter. Oh, says Dr. Ed Fulner. Okay. Uh, uh, he uh, called and begged me to include it. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. It happens to be true. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a good one. It, it, it really, and, and you and I have seen this both inside and outside. For a half century. <laughs> together <laughs> whether whether you're Barack Obama on one side or George W Bush on the other side you got to have your own people and it's it's the biggest well and people and, and related to that are ideas the neat thing about Don Rumsfeld that comes out in this book is too you talk about Milton Friedman talk a little bit about what you did when Friedman's 10-part series was was on oh television that isn't in the book yeah. but it's it's very very interesting because you as a citizen leader really helped draw him out away from the academic business into into how that really how the market system really works yeah i had just a wonderful relationship with that man he became a dear friend and uh, i'd attended a conference at the university of chicago center for continuing education and Milton was there, and the, the topic was the all-volunteer army, or, or not. And as the case may be, there were a lot of people, Ted Kennedy and Margaret Mead, and a whole bunch of people arguing against uh, calling it a mercenary army. Uh, that, that's a little stretch. The, the, the idea of paying people a fair market wage doesn't sound to me like mercenaries, but, but uh, that was their argument. And Milton Friedman's argument was fine. If you need if you need to get people in the military, uh, then by golly, um, use the and, and you can't get them in voluntarily. Then use compulsion. We have, that's fine. Have a, a draft system stand in standby, but don't use it as a crutch for paying people uh, 50, 60 percent of what the civilian man market is. And 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 also, if you have to do that, uh, you recognize you're just wasting enormous amounts of money because you're drawing people in and then shoving them out after uh, 12, 18, 24 months. And no company would do that. They wouldn't bring in a whole bunch of people, train them, and then send them away. And uh, so I got to know him, and, and I went on his program and talked about capitalism and the market system. And in the last minute, uh, I decided to add a chapter on capitalism. And the reason I did was I was disappointed in the quality of the debate and discussion. And uh, as, as Ed says, there are very few people in government today who have any background in business. And it's understandable. If you're in the academic world, that you can go in and out with relative ease. If you're a lawyer, you can go in or out of government with relative ease. If you're in, in the business community or a small business, medium or large, you, 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 first of all, small business, you can't leave it or it'll tank on you. A medium or uh, large business, you leave and you get out of the pecking order. You're gone, and and you come back in. You don't make up for that lost time. So, people are reluctant. The second problem is, um, not only do we have the fewest people who have any business background serving in government since they began accumulating the data, the other problem is people in business are reluctant to talk uh, against ideas that come out of government. Uh, because they are worried about the IRS, they worry about the Food and Drug Administration, they worry about the SEC, they worry about congressional committees calling them up. So you don't find business. Pe business people, to do well in business, you do not have to learn how to debate and discuss the, the idea of, of the markets and how they work. 
And we've seen all these Occupy Wall Street and Occupy this, and, and we watched the last presidential debate where President, uh, uh, Governor Romney was criticized while he was running for president uh, because of Bain. And, uh, and, and I got disappointed in, in watching that whole thing. And I remembered that, that there's a, a YouTube um, with Milton Friedman being interviewed with Phil Donahue, who was a kind of a long hair television uh, interviewer if, out of Chicago, as I recall. And Donahue looked at Milton Friedman and he said, Dr. Friedman, you look around the world and you see the greed and the ugliness and the meanness. Don't you, in your honest conscience and heart, wonder about capitalism and the market system? And Milton Friedman just broke his kneecaps. It was brilliant. <laughs> He's, I'm from Chicago. I have to say things like that. <laughs> he, 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 he said, there is a difference between greed and selfishness and self-interest. And it's self-interest that led to the uh, discovery of electricity and airplanes and trains and all the things that make this uh, circumstance of human beings all across the globe better. And if you haven't seen that, you ought to go look at it. Uh, but we need people who are willing, and, and as I say, business people aren't willing. They've got shareholders they have to worry about. They've got investors they have to worry about. They've got employees who have views across the spectrum. Uh, they have customers who have views across the spectrum. We saw recently there was a boycott because someone expressed their opinion on some political matter and, and uh, people announced a boycott against the company. I forgot what it was, but in it, was it, what was it? Yeah, I mean, th that's what they worry about. And it, it, that's not an unreasonable worry. If you're the, the steward over other people's money, uh, You've got to understand that. So I, I sat down and, and we did a chapter on capitalism and talked about Milton Friedman just because it bothered me. You know, I just used that phrase, other people's money. I've talked about that in there as well. There's something about human beings, probably all of us. If we're spending our money, we're attentive. We may make a mistake and waste some money, but basically we're attentive. If it's other people's money, we're not as attentive. <laughs> I don't know why, but, but it's true. It's true in a company. It's true in probably a nonprofit organization like this. It's, I don't want, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be accusatory. <laughs> and, and Ed's a friend of mine, or used to be. <laughs> but you know in government it is. And, and the reason, the big difference for government is it's every, it, it, you know it's other people's money, and, and when you get up in the morning and spend other people's money, you forget that it was er hard earned by a taxpayer. Because it wasn't, the government didn't have to work hard to get it, all they had to do was tax it, and they've got it, and then they can do these crazy things like GSA did, and go to Las Vegas and waste money, and throw it around like a drunken sailor. Uh, I was in the Navy, I don't want to say a you drunken better not sailor. Say drunken sailor. No. no, no, no. Um, <laughs> but it's just terrible what happens in government, and it's because it's other people's money. And the, and the advantage in the private sector is you do stupid things and you go out of business. You walk down any street in, in this city or any other city, uh, six months later go back, and five or ten percent of the stores will be different. Why? Because something didn't work, and something replaced it, something better, something that will work. And maybe that thing had worked for 10 years, but, but it ran out of gas, and it didn't work anymore. Circumstances changed. That's a good thing. In government, it just goes on and on and on because it's other people's money, and it can't fail. It, there's nothing you can substitute in there, which I would submit is an argument against big government. Pretty good to me. Well, you're <laughs> now, when you talk in here about Chicago, when you and I grew up in Chicago, you know, we had Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward, exactly. Marshall Fields, Carson Peary Scott. Uh, wow, what a change. Uh, great quote here. If American business does not earn sufficient revenue to earn a fair profit, the government cannot earn sufficient revenues to cover its outlays. John, John F. Kennedy. Kennedy. 
Yeah, it's amazing. John F. Kennedy uh, said that, and you couldn't get anyone in this government to even think it, let alone say it. <laughs> but it's the truth. I mean, government, uh, you know, in that last campaign, people kept talking about, we're going to grow jobs, we're going to grow. Government doesn't grow jobs. All government can do is create an environment that's hospitable to risk-taking, to investment. And, and, uh, and to the extent government does things that is are inhospitable to enterprise and investment, obviously, uh, money's a coward. It votes with its feet. It goes somewhere else. It goes where there's a better opportunity. And uh, all you have to, to do to understand government is to, well, of course, Washington, D.C., as I say, is, is described as 60 square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you drive down any street and look up, you can see in any direction four, five, or six of those cranes. Here you've got a country where you've got a large unemployment, things are not going well, and this place is booming, absolutely booming. Why? It's other people's money. <laughs> You're getting crib notes from somebody? Uh, I, I am, but I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, still, I'm still working on these. I know. Okay, that. yeah. No, these are questions from the audience, but let me... Try another one from Fulner's sheet. 1987, you may not remember, but Linda and Ed Fulner actually sent a check to Rumsfeld for president. Boy, uh, that, went did, down, that went down the drain. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. And but the only thing you say in here about why it didn't work was you couldn't raise the money. I couldn't. I remember calling up John Glenn. I was out of government, so I didn't have free offices and free telephone and free staff and all of those things. I, I, I remember calling John Glenn, a good guy, and he'd run for president and pulled out. And he, he announced the reason he pulled out was he had some money. He'd been very successful financially. But he'd, in, he'd, he'd given his campaign $50,000, which was the maximum you could give as an individual back then, it may still be, uh, and as long as you were hoping to take uh, matching funds from the government. And he saw the bills going up, and he saw the intake low and the expenditures high. And he could see, in fact, he got himself in a cul-de-sac where, where his employees and vendors never got paid because he couldn't use any, it would be against the law to use any more of his money because he'd already spent the, give, given the 50000 and he knew he couldn't raise any more. He couldn't raise it as fast as he was spending it. And I called him up, and, and he explained what had happened, and, uh, and I decided, I'm, I'm out of here. I don't want to do that. I don't want to end up stiffing employees and stiffing vendors. And it, when I, I, I can see that, that all the people I was up against tended to be people who had either individual wealth and didn't need matching funds, or they were people who were in government and... And, and had that nice advantage. Hmm. So life goes what, on. What, yeah, yeah, what might have been. Uh, Andrew, one of our guests here, says, Mr. Secretary, you were widely recognized, one of the few people in Washington, with the experience and gravitas to reform the Pentagon. Goes on and 9-11 happened. Where are we today versus where we would have been had things work the way you wanted it to? Well, interestingly, um, the idea that 9-11 that stopped the President Bush's goal of bringing the Pentagon into the 21st century and into the information age, the idea that 9-11 inhibited that and stopped it, I think, is simply not accurate. I think what happened was, uh, in a strange way, it provided a sense of urgency and impetus and, and enabled us to do some things that we probably otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Um, I, I mean, the, I'll give you an example. I mean, the enormous change that took place in the United States Army once we got General Pete Schoomaker in, a former Special Forces officer, uh, and who was head but retired, and we, we brought him in. And he ended up moving the Army away from divisions, which had flags, history books, songs, and, and uh, moved them to brigade combat teams, which increased the flexibility and the ability of the United States to make just amazing change. 
the opposition to special operations forces, which was ingrained in the services, ground, in the ground services, certainly in the Army and, and as well in the Marines. That opposition lessened because it became pretty apparent that we were facing not a big Army or a big Navy or a big Air Force. We were facing some asymmetrical threats, and uh, we were able to increase the special operations forces, I think, by about 50 percent. Um, we were in able to improve their equipment. We were able to increase their authorities. And we also dropped some of the lower Tier 3 activities and moved them over to the conventional forces so that the Tier 1 and Tier, tier 2 activities could be done by a larger number of special operators. And they, they have gotten as good as any military force on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. They do a great job. They were in, in, Vern Clark in the Navy, one of his quotes in there is, this war is not like the last war. This war is not like the next war. This war is like this war. It's, it sounds silly, but it's not. It's, it's the truth. And uh, Vern Clark came in one day and he briefed on the aircraft. I said, come in and show me where all the aircraft carriers are, aircraft uh, carrier battle groups. And he gets a map of the world and he comes in and with little black round things that look like hockey pucks. And, and, you know, three quarters, at least three quarters, were right along the coast, the west coast and the east coast. And I, I said, boy, golly, in business, if you build a bunch of factories and then use them three or four hours a day, four <laughs> days a week, uh, you'd go broke. You can't do that. Uh, what's going on? And this guy, Vern Clark, saw the need and, and had the oomph to cause the Navy to literally change how they functioned. And uh, Bill Ludy's back here. He's a, a ex-Naval officer. And uh, w what Vern Clark was able to do was to go from, for, for the sake of argument, three or four out of 12 carrier battle groups available to do what you pay for them to do, be out and present and, and ready, to not just three or four, he shifted how they did things. He did crew, crew swaps and so you, these long transit times back and forth. He finally figured out a way we could do some of the re refurbishing uh, outside the United States. And we ended up not, not with three or four carrier battle groups available at any given time, but, but uh, seven or eight. Um, and big difference. I mean, really, he doubled the capability with the same amount of money. And uh, there were, you could go to any one of the services. And, and a lot of important things got done uh, in, in transforming. Uh, I, I, I caught the Dickens in the press. That's when I learned to say, I stand by what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I caught the Dickens when I said, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you would like. And of course, the people said, oh my goodness, how could he say that terrible thing? And, it happens to be true, and, and not that that bothers some people, but each president has available to them only that which is left by their predecessor. Almost anything you do in your period, your time, uh, is going to benefit your successor or harm your successor. And uh, the changes that have been made during the Bush presidency have been significant and they, they, if people say, oh, Rumsfeld, you had a bunch of ideas about modernizing the military and so forth. I didn't. I'd been in the pharmaceutical business, the electronics business, and, and uh, he, the president uh, put together a group of people when he was running for president, uh, George W. Bush, and gave speeches, I think, at the Cit Citadel in different mm -hmm. places, and laid out a program of transforming that he wanted done, and that's what I was asked to do. Uh, you know, uh, I canceled the Crusader, which was an artillery piece that took two enormous cargo places to cargo planes to move any place. And I would submit that in this environment it wasn't perfectly named either. <laughs> but but I caught sense. the Dickens. I mean, Steve Bucci's here somewhere. Uh, Steve was in the office and and. Uh, I mean, the people in the army were just beside themselves that I would do that. It's just an outrageous thought. Who does he think he is? The president and I decided that, that and all the money, we, we didn't take it away from the army. We stuck it right into precision 
weaponry that has vastly improved our capability. But, but there's enormous resistance in the Iron Triangle, so to speak, the permanent bureaucracy in the Pentagon, the permanent bureaucracy in the Congress and the staffs there and the committees and the uh, defense industry. They get things arranged roughly the way they'd like them. And uh, when someone, president gets elected and comes in and has different ideas, uh, change is hard for people. And, uh, and, and so there's resistance in a bureaucracy. I've got a chapter on bureaucracy in there too. And uh, it is, uh, I think it was Rick Ober also who said, if you're gonna sin, sin against God, God will forgive you. <laughs> Do not sin against the bureaucracy. <laughs> it never they forgets never anything. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get you one way or another. How do you manage your time when you have so many really important things to do in your life? Imperfectly. Um, the, if, if you find, or if I find, if anyone finds that they're working off their inbox, their emails, their incoming phone calls, things you're supposed to do, then you know that you're working off other people's priorities. And if you get people working off your outbox, the likelihood is they're working off your priorities. And that's a pretty good way to think about it. Someone else in there, I think it was maybe Hutchins said uh, that, that the, um, the urgent has a way of, of uh, overpowering the important. The important. And, and it's true. The thing that's pressing on you tends to cause you to not do what may be much more important. Uh, my favorite rule in there is, is what you measure improves. Um, it's true. If you decide you're going to measure something because you think it's important to you, that's hard to do because once you say this is important, you're saying basically it's more important than something else. But once you do say that's important and then you use metrics to manage how you're doing, I don't care if it's whatever it may be, reading, reading something or meeting with certain types of people or watching your weight, um, if you decide to measure it, in the military they say the same thing a different way. They say you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And uh, pretty soon, if the military guy comes around and explains that, that you're not making your bed right or your rifle isn't clean, uh, the, he does it once or twice, and pretty soon the rifle's going to be clean or the bed's going to be made properly. And uh, if every time someone comes around the corner, they know the boss is going to ask, how are the receivables or the payables or working capital against sales, whatever it is, then they're going to pay attention to that. And uh, it seems to me that that's, that's a critically important rule. It's, it's even it, better than your rule in there. It, well, it is, but yeah. if you don't know what your top three priorities are, you don't have priorities. That's probably that's, true. That's yours, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Here's an interesting one. Who are the top three leaders, in your opinion, historically? Why were they leaders? I don't know if we're talking about like a, a Lincoln I, I, or a Washington. I, or yeah, I don't go I back don't thousands you know. of years. I've lived uh, one third of the history of our country, and I can I can go back that far. Um, I mean, clearly, President Reagan was a strategic thinker, and and he, he planted some standards way out there and said that's that's where we're going. Uh, and he kind of tapped people if they got off track, and and if they started veering away from where he was heading. Uh, people accused him of being somewhat simplistic when, when they asked him about his policy with respect to the Soviet Union. He said, we win, they lose. <laughs> and everyone in the organization knew, mm, I get it. That's where he wants to go, and that's a, that's, we better go in that direction. Jim Lynn, who was head of the budget one time, commented about President Jimmy Carter, and I. And he said, Jimmy Carter is the kind of a president who knows all 6,877 parts of an automobile, but doesn't know where he's going. And, and the micro view is a totally different view. And Jimmy Carter was a smart guy, and he did know a, a lot of micro things. President Reagan didn't pay much attention to micro things. He paid attention to directional things, stra stra strategic things. 
And I think, so I, I would say that's a, an attribute. I, I was at uh, Nasser's funeral. That's not something very many people can say. Mm. Uh, the president sent uh, John McCloy, the former high commissioner of Germany, and uh, Robert Murphy, the former diplomat among warriors. Uh, and we went over there. We had lousy relationships, obviously, with Egypt. The Soviet Union was crawling all over the place. They had tanks and airplanes and troops and everything. So they didn't want to send anyone who was in the diplomatic business. And, and they got three people from outside to do it. So we went. And the intelligence briefing said that this fellow who was acting president, he was the current vice president, was a little bit of a lightweight because Nasser didn't like to have anyone strong around him, which happens. And uh, so we went in to meet with this fellow named Sadat, who was the acting president. Mm -hmm. and all three of us walked out of there and thought to ourselves, isn't that interesting? He was a presence. And uh, he, among, among other things, he said that he, um, he, his only real problem with the United States was Israel. And left us with the impression that he was not enamored of the Soviet Union. And I forget how long it was thereafter, but I think within a year or so, the Soviets were gone. And within a couple, three years, he ends up going to Jerusalem and I think sp speaking to the Knesset, didn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, got, now, admittedly, he got killed by uh, one of the organizations uh, connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. And, uh, but he was a strong figure uh, with a lot of courage and, and did some big things uh, and changed the order of things. And it's not easy to change the order of it, 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 you have to be bold, and he was bold. Um, I left you out just to be Great. gracious. Okay. <laughs> but imagine, you, imagine what he's done. He literally was a young PhD, which is not bad, but it's certainly not a key to success necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> and and he decided he he, he he decided something was missing in this town. And, uh, and he was right. And what was missing was this thing that exists today uh, as heritage. And, and that's a, a big thing. Um, I worried when he started building the buildings. I thought he was getting an edifice complex. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he would lose focus. And, and, uh, and I told him so. And it turned out I was wrong and he was right. It, it, it's an impressive accomplishment. I certainly don't want to interrupt that train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, one of the things you talk about, and you go back to Kennedy and his relationship with Bobby Kennedy, you talk about Reagan in the kitchen cabinet, you talk about the importance of friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody in the room and watching knows that you and Dick Cheney are really close. How many friends do you have? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is a serious yeah. question. Uh, well, I don't know. You know, I, I still see high school friends. I, uh-oh, uh look out, you're getting uh -oh. a hook. Three minutes. Okay. Three minutes, I see. Okay. I, I still invite uh, college friends. Uh, every three or four or five years, we have a gathering of our friends. And, fr you know, people who you know well can keep you rooted. They can... Say things to you that other folks aren't going to say. And it, it is a help to keep your friends and, and to value them. Uh, and uh, there, there are, it, it, it is a very, very enriching thing for me that friends from high school and college are, are friends to this day. And um, because they are able to um, remember you in, in a context that's different and, and uh, perfectly comfortable in telling you you're full of beans. Yeah, but along the line. Even I, if they're I, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Ned Janetta, guys like that. But along the lines, John Robeson, people like that, oh my, who you yeah. didn't grow up with. I did. Oh, John did? Robeson and I were in high school together. Oh, you, oh, you were in New Trudy. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. And I, I married yeah. my wife in 1954, which is 
I've been married my whole life. Same how woman. Did, <laughs> how does she put up with you? <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> hell, this is. <laughs> That's that, a setup. <laughs> that's in the book, too. Someone asked her, how in the world could you stay married to that guy all those years? And she says, he travels a lot. <laughs> I thought she was kidding. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, she, uh, she's, she's seen it all. She's been around. And, and uh, I think there's a, another her rule in there that you avoid... Uh, resentment of or infatuation with the press. Don, they have their job and you have your job. And that's not bad thought. It, it, it keeps it in balance. It's, uh, it's a different job. Her father was a wise man, too. He one day time said to me two things. He said, first of all, if you're coasting, you're going downhill. True. The other thing he said, Don, Somehow or another, get six months' salary in the bank, no matter what you're making. And then if some boss ever tells you to do something that you don't want to do and you don't believe in doing, or you think it's immoral or illegal or wrong or dumb, you can tell them to go to hell. Not bad advice for a young man. Boy, with those comments, <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we'll have, to, have to call it quits at this stage of the game. This has been a fascinating hour. So. Thank you. It's, it's a great book. I commend it to everybody. Uh, you will get a lot out of it. Mr. Secretary, it's been a pleasure to have you back with us. And did and you kick the price up out there? And of course, to, the to books are out here for sale. Something off for heritage. I and guess. the next, and the next <laughs> request is for those wanting to have the secretary sign it. If you will line up along the stage, starting from that side of the auditorium, we'll have a table up here for him to sign uh, momentarily. Otherwise, I'm sure Dr. Fulner would be glad to sign page 44, 42, <laughs> where his book. Is. <laughs>